Okay, good evening, folks, and welcome to another segment of the Cold Hard Truth. This is Sandra Hill. I am your ghost, your host, my, your ghost. Well, hopefully, you have no ghost. Um, I am your host for the evening, and um, as usual, we're here every Tuesday and Thursday at 7 p.m. sharp. Uh, I have a special guest who's going to be joining me this evening. This is quite an interesting discussion. Um, we're actually trying to help a young lady find her biological mom or her family um, in any way that we can. So we are certainly delighted to be able to assist her with that endeavor this evening. Um, If you're just joining the program, I just want to remind you that we do have the option now for you to actually um, call into the program via WhatsApp. So just a reminder that the WhatsApp number is 324-1612. And again, you're more than welcome to, um, you know, join into the program. If you have any questions or comments or, you know, you'd like to share something with this young lady, we would certainly invite you to do so. Tell us, you know, what your thoughts are and how she can find her family. So we've got tons of um information that she has provided us. We've got birth certificates. We've got all sorts of documents. I'm going to try to load these documents up here in just a minute. We do have um, some, uh, sorry, we do have some pictures of her as well, which I think will be useful. And if you were someone who was in Cayman in the early 1980s, I want you to really, really pay attention because, you know, you talk about six degrees of separation, And that's how the world operates now. So you may not know her directly, but once you start to hear her story, it might jog your memory and you may think of someone who may know her um, type of thing. And you might think, oh, yeah, well, this reminds me of a situation. And then perhaps you can um, you know, advise who she could be related to. Um, she's here because she's willing to try anything at this point in time to try to locate her family and You know, I think that any of us listening to this can certainly sympathize with how she must feel trying to make that connection with her biological family. Uh, So first of all, I wanted to say that sometimes these family connections can be very, very difficult. I mean, recently I found out that someone I know in this community had a child that I never knew anything about. I never heard anything about. And apparently, you know, the child was sent back to Jamaica, was raised by a grandparent. And people here were told that 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 particular child was somebody else in the family, that it didn't belong to that particular woman. So there's a lot of times that families are holding secrets for whatever reasons. Um, I can't always speak to why that is, but there are a lot of families in Cayman where it's like, you know, your cousin turns out to eventually be your brother or your sister. Um, or there are just situations where people just didn't own children that they had, which is so incredibly sad. And so you're going to school that you're actually related to, and you don't even know it. So it's kind of crazy, right? And I think it, it's good that she's certainly making the, um, the journey to try to locate her biological family. And I think that you know anyone who embarks on this kind of journey should receive as much support as possible. There are tons of documents that we're going to show you this evening. I think that someone out there listening to this program or who may watch this program later on has got to know who this young lady is or who she's connected to. Because like I said, it's all about six degrees of separation. And we now live in a world where everyone is connected online, social media, and so forth. So I'm I'm hopeful that someone will definitely know who she is. So we're going to go ahead and welcome Sarah to the program. Good evening. And thank you for joining us. Thank you. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I just really want to express that gratitude. I'm very, very grateful. Yeah. I'm going to move over a little bit so I can make sure that I'm in the thing here. Okay. (laughs) I just wanted to, um, I mean, of course, we're happy to have you on the program. And like I said, I can sympathize with your plight. We often hear of children who were adopted looking for their family members later on. Can you let us know why now? Why are you looking for your mom at least and perhaps additional family members? Um, yeah, great question. I have children of my own now. So it, it's getting a little deeper than just like me saying, okay, I accept that basically I'm a blank slate. So like yeah. when we're going to the doctor's office and um, they're asking about, you know, 
family historical um, issues? Are there any things that you know of? You know, they'll go down the line. And I'm like, I have no information for any of the above. Yeah. And they're flabbergasted, and then I give them the adoption reason. Yeah. Um, and so if my- I can, If I can just pause you there for one second, because that is a really valid point. Because mm-hmm. I've been, you know, I've have I have a three year old, and during my pregnancy, I had to go and do genetic testing and whatever. And they, I was in Miami, and they gave me a battery of questions. And a lot of it was like, you know, do you have any family members that have this disease or that disease? Or I mean, they wanted to know so much information. And to be honest, despite me knowing, you know, my family, I don't know a lot of them all that well because I grew up, you know, with an aunt, and so I was really. Okay. So I can definitely understand how that information, when it's not readily available, you feel kind of awkward in the moment. For me, I was like popping an older sister saying, hey, you know, they want to know this, they want to know that. And she was able to provide me with the responses to give the individuals who were taking on all the data. But yeah, that's a good point that just even from a medical perspective, sometimes to know what runs in your family do you have a you know predisposition to cancers or diabetes or whatever Who knows? <laughs> i'm just like shrug the shoulders yeah. every time but now it's kind of gotten a little more deep for me too because i just went recently to a dermatologist i've always suffered from like skin issues since i came on the island actually i was in a really in-depth study as an infant because as soon as i got here i guess my skin just exploded and we've always just uh um assumed it was because of the climate change like the humongous climate change. I'm in Minnesota right now where it gets to be like negative 22 degrees, you know, and going from the tropics, maybe I don't, I don't know if, you know, my bloodline has ever been exposed to something like this. You know, that's what everybody's thinking. So um, they me through a lot of tests and they just chalked it up to eczema. But now um, I'm 36 and it's, it's not looking like that's what it is. So um, the dermatologist actually referred me to go to like a GP to possibly um, check on like an autoimmune disease. Um, So tell us, where is it? Where do you live now, Sarah? Tell us a little bit about where you're at, how many kids you've got, kind of what's going on in your life at the moment. Sure. Yeah, I'm in Minnesota. Um, I've been here for three years. I lived in the Bahamas for the last 10 years before I moved back home. I was originally adopted and came straight to Minnesota. So I was raised here up until I was about 23. And that's when I went down to the Bahamas to live there for a while. Okay. Right. I have okay. two children, um, a boy and a girl, a son and a daughter. They're 10 and 9. Okay, awesome. Very good. All right. So tell us, um, how did you, did you know from day one that you were adopted? Um, I know you shared with me why you knew that, but tell our audience basically, you know, how you were told that you were adopted and what your childhood dynamics were like growing up. Yeah, um, it was very obvious because my whole family is actually white. I was adopted into a Norwegian family and then my mother got married to a Samoan man. Um, that's where the name Suopia comes from. It's a Samoan name. And um, so it was very obvious. I'm dark skinned black girl, you know, <laughs> <Can't even laughs> with, with, with a Samoan dad and a white mom. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so it was like something's different. Something is not like the others. Yeah. So those questions were very, you know, prominent for my mom. I know from I could ask questions. So um, but beyond that, I, I did not really associate like colors until um, I went into school. So not until I was about five or six. Mm-hmm. Was that really like, oh, OK, this this is a thing to everybody, you know, like. Right. I don't know how to explain that. Like I knew we were different colors, but I didn't know that that really meant anything. Right. Yes. Yeah, because one of those things where until other people point it out to you, yeah, that it's not as obvious. That you don't um, really know, yeah. exactly. Okay, I'm going to try to pull up a picture here of you and your mom, actually. This is the cutest little picture that you sent us. Um, so this is your adopted mom. Now, how did, how did she find you? Where were you adopted? What, did she come to the Cayman Islands? And you know, I think she just went to the adoption agency. She was um, a single nurse at the time. She was a single woman. Um, no prospect of like anything going on as far as I understood. She was um, just bought a house. And um, I don't know what, you know, the funny thing is, or not funny, it's actually quite tragic, but my mom was not able to conceive and she adopted me before she knew that. So she had four miscarriages subsequent to adopting me. Right. Wow. Okay. I'm just trying to pull up your picture here, Sarah. Um, 
Sometimes a little technical glitch occurs. <laughs> but let me just see if I can do that real quick. It's not letting me do it. Um, so, right. So your adopted mom, um, she had fertility issues. And yeah. And I guess one of the options available to her was obviously adoption. Right. But like I said, she didn't know about those fertility issues before she adopted me. Oh, really? So, so she yeah. just adopted you because she wanted to adopt you? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Very yeah. interesting. Yeah. I'm just going to refresh my page. In the meantime, um, tell us a little bit about what it was growing up. Did you have any curiosities when you were growing up about who your biological parents were and where you were from? I did. Yeah. Um, I should also mention that my little brother, who is not blood related, is also African American, who is African American. He is um, he was adopted from Texas. So it was me and him. He came around about two years after I was adopted. So we grew up together as siblings, um, although we weren't blood related. You know, I'm still my brother, obviously. So yeah. uh, going back, um, I, like I said, have been raised in Minnesota. Um, so this is a very white state. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's always been very apparent that the way I've been raised is different from everybody else. Mm -hmm. and, um, it, it's just been... Um, I'm sorry, what was the question? <laughs> I'm yeah, sure I get your okay. yeah, I was just sort of asking about your curiosities um, growing up. Oh. Were you curious about, you know, where you were from? Um, even before you became an adult, were you kind of thinking, I need to find my real mom? Or did you kind of put that aside? I know a lot of kids feel guilty about trying to do that search while their biological parent, or their adopted parent, sorry, is still alive. Did you have any of those thoughts? Yes. Um, I was plagued with guilt. Um, and I remember a specific dinner actually where uh, we were having dinner. It was a big like family reunion and the topic of like how my adopted family migrated from Scandinavia to North Dakota to Fargo and then finally Minnesota. They just talked about all of that and, and kind of the food trail that happened and how this lefsa ended up on my plate. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was intrigued by the story and then I left there though feeling really, really bad. And I remember my mom probing me to find out like what was going on. And I just told her like, I don't understand. Like you have so much information, you know, like the food that I just ate, your great, great grandma ate. What did my great, great grandma eat? And um, that's kind of where I guess the guilt kicked in for me because the reaction was so strong. The reaction was um, great grandma, so-and-so is your great grandma and you shouldn't question, you know, anything else about it. Your mom had you, left you in the hospital and left. That's all you really need to know. Like we are your family. So um, I'm not, I'm not like a, probably this is why I'm on this journey right now. I don't take no very well. <laughs> so I continued to that conversation and I ended up in tears, bawling, feeling 100% guilty for even bringing it up. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I just wanted to know though. And I, I wanted to know why was it so bad for me to know? And why was it okay for me not to know, but y'all know, like, how is that okay? And how is it okay for you? You know, like, can we just go there? Can we find out things? And I was always told it was too mm -hmm. expensive. Um, we'll go when you're 18. Like it was always pushed off, pushed off, you know, cause it was too expensive. I saved the money, you know, it became, you know, I was 18 now. Oh, but you have college expenses. Like it was just always something as to why not. And then I just accepted it for a long time. Wow. I didn't uh, get reconvicted. I'll say, mm -hmm. Cause I've done this search. I've been on Facebook ever since 2005 when it opened up and I was looking for Gloria Green. I was looking for everybody in the Cayman Islands. I was tagging, I was messaging, no response. So it was repeaked when I went down to the Bahamas and I actually spoke to a, um, a Jamaican lady. She's a friend of mine, um, or I should say acquaintance. Cause it, you know, she didn't know my full story, but that day I just happened to tell her that um, my understanding is I was born in the Cayman Islands and my mom had me at the hospital. She left an alias. She left a Jane Doe. And um, I was named Sarah at the hospital. Actually, I told her the story and she was like, when, when were you born? You know? And I told her 
in the 80s, 1983. And she said, no, no child. <laughs> she just shook her head and she said, no child. You are a healthy, strong baby girl. There is no reason on the island you didn't go to one Grammy, one auntie, one cousin, you know, there's no reason for that. You're you're obviously healthy, beautiful little girl. I I could never imagine it. And before you would see something like that, you would see somebody begging on the side of the road with their children before they would just give them up, especially to go to another foreign country. She said, that's just, it's just unfathomable, (laughs) unfathomable. Um, And it piqued my interest because by then I had been in the Bahamas for about eight years and I was able to compare American life from island life. I got to, you know, firsthand experience the fact that there are no senior high rise conglomerate industry, you know, industries of nursing homes. There is not that there. There is no like huge orphanages, you know. There's orphanages, obviously, but it's not to the degree where, you know, adoption agencies are right here where you can just, you don't want your kid. You know, it's a lot easier to kind of separate family here in Minnesota because we're so independently ran. That's just the culture. Like everything is independent. You know, if you become a burden, you get dealt with. Right. But Island, from what I understood after living there is if you have a burden, you get taken in. Right. Okay. So it, it's a lot. It's a lot smaller of a place, obviously. And I just want to pull up some of your documents here, and I want to pull up your birth certificate because obviously you've been provided with these documents. Um, I must say that it is it is a little unusual. I don't really know a whole lot about adoptions in the early '80s. I mean, I would have been a child myself, mm-hmm. and I actually moved away around the same time that you were born. I moved off island to go live with an aunt overseas. So okay. I don't know what would have been in place um, in terms of adoption options. I know right now it's incredibly difficult for anyone to adopt a child, especially someone. Really? So I am a bit curious about how your mom, did she ever say to you how she came to the Cayman Islands to be able to adopt you to begin with? She never been there. She still ain't never been. <laughs> never <laughs> been has- to the Cayman Islands. So how did she you never? Huh? I'm just going to pull up your birth certificate here, but how did you actually get adopted by her? If she's never been here, as far as I understood, it was I was just an option within the adoption agency, and she chose me. Wow! So there's um, some, there's some adoption. Say, did the audio go out? If you're talking, I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Um, hey, that's gotcha. yeah. It looks like whenever I come out of this area, for some reason, um, you can't hear me. But, no, my question was the adoption agency. Is that adoption agency supposedly in the States, like in Minnesota or in the Cape? Yeah, it's in Minnesota. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, We have your birth certificate here, and it says that you were born Georgetown and South Sound. That is a little unusual, I must say. Also, um, it's not one of the same. No, because I have a birth certificate, and it'll say like Georgetown, and then you know, eventually Cayman Islands. So I'm not sure why it says Georgetown and South Sound. South Sound is a part of Georgetown. Okay, so this is really really strange. Um, and I don't know what PA number one forty six means. But it says that the midwife was Shirley Granson. Yeah. So if anyone who, you know, worked at the hospital in 1983 and might have known a midwife by this name, uh, that would be useful information. If anyone um, knows Gloria Green. So Gloria Green is supposedly your mother. Right. And according to this birth certificate, she was 27 years at the time of giving you birth, um, she's a domestic, she was a domestic worker and she was resident at Church Street, which is, you know, that is a street here in, George, in Georgetown. Um, but she, she's from Jamaica. Now I noticed they have Jamaica misspelled. <laughs> really? And, I didn't even notice that. Yeah. And supposedly she had 
um, two children by the time you she had you, so you would have been her third child. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no information mentioned in terms of father. And then it says that um, someone by the name of E. Gay Jackson, director of social services, maybe, actually certified the birth. So um, it looks like someone else obtained the birth certificate and registered it as opposed to your mom going to do that. Mm. And you notice it was done about a week after you were born. Um, registrar certificate is Blondell Redden. So again, if anyone knows any of these parties that may remember, you know, some of this information, um, please step forward and provide any details. Miss um, Lisa Andrews says that the lady that was doing adoptions at the time through government was named Barbara. I think that last name is Rush, if I'm not mistaken. So maybe we can try to, I don't know if Miss Barbara is still alive or not. But maybe we could certainly try to reach out to Barbara um, and see, you know, what additional information we could obtain. And I'm just going to have a look at some of your other documents that you have here that I think could be useful. Can I tell you something about that birth certificate, too? So I never saw that until my mom died. I was given all of my adoption information. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, again, that repeat my interest, because like I said, I was always told that uh, my birth mother was a Jane Doe, basically, right? But how do you know Jane Doe had two kids, lived on Church Street, and was 27 years old from Kingston, Jamaica? How do you know all that if right. she's a Jane Doe? Yeah. So it's like, I, I don't know what the real story is, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you happen upon this birth certificate after your adopted mom passed away. Correct. Yeah. All of those documents that I sent to you beyond the the uh, birth certificate with my last name being Sue. Yeah, I've never seen those before. So right. I never knew that. Like, I go by Gogo now. Um, Sarah was a name that was given to me at the hospital and I, I kept it, you know, legally. That's my binding name. Uh-huh. Um, that I was I was told that the hospital gave me Sarah. My middle name is Joe, which is also my adopted mom's name. Now, when I was first at the hospital, I was green. When my mom married me, she was single, so her last name is Muniz. And then um, she um, married her ex husband, who was Samoan. So then it was Sue. Um, Sorry, what, what was your adopted mom's last name? Munis at the time that she adopted. Munis, okay. So my name went from green to Munis and then from Munis to Suopia. Right, okay. All right, so let's have a look at this next document here. So this document purports to be um, the adoption, the actual adoption document. So it says here that it happened in the Grand Court of the Cayman Islands, cause number uh, 140 of 1984. And I'm just trying to read it here. So this happened on the 19th of April of 84. So basically less than a year after you were born, you were adopted. Yeah. Because you were born in 83 and I think it was, was it June of 83? Yes. Yeah. So then it says here that you were adopted under the children's law, um, section 24, and then we have a grand court judge. I don't know whose signature that is. I mean, I have no idea. They didn't actually have a name, but it does say it's, you know, certified copy. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, it does say that obviously you were being adopted by Lori yep. of the address in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Yep. So if if your adopted mom had never been to the Cayman Islands, how did she know about you? That's what I'm saying. I don't know really how adoptions work. I don't know if you're given a book and, you know, I don't know how it works. But I was, you know, she knew about me through the adoption agency. I was a, I was an option. Yeah. For her. That's, that's That is a little weird, I must say, for you to hear about a child all the way in the Cayman Islands. And someone has made a suggestion here that, Maybe your adopted mom was actually somehow connected to your real mother. So maybe they had a relationship, but she never disclosed that to you. So Possibly. Once, I have no idea. Yeah. Once but, I mean, there, maybe your mom actually lived here at some point in time. Oh, no, 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 no. So you're, you're 100% sure that your mother never lived in the Cayman Islands? I'm 100% sure, yeah. 
My mom, yeah. Um, she hadn't been out of the country before she came to see me in the Bahamas for my wedding. Hmm. Oh, if, I mean, and we're talking 1983. They couldn't have no online interactions you know mm-hmm. what i understand is that i was escorted um by plane by um an official from there from the cayman islands and she gave me to my mom in the airport hmm. okay suggestion here that maybe it was a church adoption again i mean something something is missing from your story yeah. And I'm hoping that someone out there who's listening to this can uh, um, provide the missing link for you, you know, because I do think there's so much more to, to this than actually is obvious to us. I get, yeah. th- I get that feeling. Like, that's just a gut feeling. Um, let's just have a look at some of your other documents that are here. So you have this one. Um, let me just pull this up so that everyone can see it. Um, I mean, I, I can I can really understand why you have a lot of questions because even me just looking at this, I get the sense this wasn't really just a straightforward adoption situation. There's so much more to this story. So here's another document that you've provided us. And this one is a notice of approval of relative immigrant visa status. So this yeah. now is where... Um, This is where you would have received basically your U.S. like green card or whatever. Is that what this is? Yep. Yep. That happens before I come over and then I get naturalized. That's what happened. Right. So this is weird, though. How do you how does your mom make a petition for you? Basically filed it shortly after you were adopted. I mean, immediately after the adoption was sealed Mm -hmm. in April of 84 and. And um, it went through the Kingston, Jamaica consulate. And then it says approval cabled. I mean, it seems like she was moving kind of quickly to secure. Like when you talk about that and, you know, when you think about orphans, you know, there's orphans here in the States that could be orphans for so long. And we're talking internationally in the 1980s, right? Cayman Islands, small country. And this is moving like fast for even now when you, when you really break it down. Mm -hmm. I don't know. (laughs) It's just, I I don't know. um, It's definitely, I've got some people private messaging me as well. You know, I think people definitely have some questions here. So let's continue looking at your documentation because I think in many respects, um, the answers are here somewhere. You know, it's, it's, it's in your papers. I feel like whatever information is going to come, you know, from this, um, it has to be in your document. So have you made any attempts to, um, go to Jamaica or to look up your mom's mean green? It sounds like a very common name. I hate it's to say common. That. It's so yeah. common. <laughs> I was in the army. I was in the army for eight years and at training at basic training there's three jamaican drill sergeants with the last name green and it gave me no hope so no i have not been because i want to go with something you know like it's so Uh big and there's so much questions i just even a cousin a second cousin you know like a friend of the family anybody (laughs) just that one little dot to connect something for me that's all and you know like you preluded in the beginning of this you know sometimes we as adoptees, we are symbols of some trauma. And that's really not my intention. I really want to say this. Yeah. It's not my intention to be the ripped off band-aid, the 36-year-old wound and come up over here and rip it off. I'm not intending that. And I don't want to push myself on that at all. Right. You know, on anybody with, you know, don't assume those intentions. I'm not coming to assimilate to any family. I'm meeting mm-hmm. strangers that I am related to by blood. You understand? Mm-hmm. And yeah. I'd like to understand why I do the things I do, who I look like, and just answer those questions for me because I feel like I deserve to know. I, I yeah. don't know why I've accepted for so long that I don't. So right. that's pretty it. And if that means just standing across the street from the house, that, you know, family, that's fine. I can just see it. I'll be happy with that. I can walk away at least knowing something. Right. 
And this, this next document that's on the screen, this is a, what's called a consent and approval. And this is from the state of Minnesota, Department of Public Welfare, Division of Social Services. Um, I find it kind of interesting that it seems like social services in Minnesota was so involved in the process, especially since your adoption is coming from an external country. Mm. Um, that is a little bit interesting as well, but maybe that was, you know, their formalities back then. I don't really know. Um, but this seems to basically just verify that the home that you were going into was a safe and acceptable home. Like they did a home study right. um, kind of thing and it was, you know, safe for you to be in that home. Um, yeah. I mean, a lot of questions, definitely a lot of questions, Sarah. Um, yeah. For sure. Yeah. So let's, let's just have another look. You have another document here. I do want to pull this one up. So I think this one looks quite interesting as well. Um, this has got your little baby picture on it. Um, let me just see which one that's it. So this is a, um, you might have to help me out with exactly what this document is. That's my naturalization papers. So that's the official document of naturalization. Okay, so this is United States of America, I see. And there's your little baby picture. Um, okay. Yeah. So again, she got you your green card right away. The following year, she made sure that you were an American citizen. I must say she was very diligent with her paperwork. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah, she's on point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um which is, is very, very interesting. Now this certificate of live birth, this is another one. I'm just gonna, um, I'm curious if anyone who might've worked in the registrar knows why these documents all have this Georgetown South Sound. Was that a way of them doing it back then? Because I have a birth certificate from 1973 and it makes no mention of South Sound whatsoever. It just says Georgetown. So I keep wondering who would have been typing this in such a manner. So here's another one that is, um, again, certificate of live birth. This is, I guess, well, this is the Minnesota Department of Health. So I guess they simply copied what was on your birth certificate. Right. Yeah. That's the one that I've always been aware of. I never right. knew of the other ones. Right. Mm. Hmm. Okay. So what do you hope, um, you know, at the end of the day, someone's listening to this program, what are, what's your sense that, you know, I think there's definitely somebody out there who knows more about this story and about, you know, who your family to, and what might have transpired. Um, I do find it a little strange that your mom had no connection to the Cayman Islands, um, didn't know your your biological and doctor parents supposedly didn't know each other and she okay. would have been able to pull off an adoption like this. That, that to me seems unusual, especially in the eighties. Do you know what? I have something else to tell you. And maybe this might be a connection because um, from the hospital, I was there for a while and then um, I went into a foster home <clears throat> Dan and Nancy are the names of the, my foster parents. They were also a white couple and they were interested in adopting me in the, um, in the Cayman uh, Islands. So I don't know if. They someone, so someone told you that people here, like you went into foster care here. Yeah. Yeah. I went in. Okay. And what, what were those names that you just mentioned? Dan and Nancy, but I don't know. I'll ask Dan you. and Nancy. So if anyone's listening to the program, um, and they know a Dan or Nancy that maybe, you know, might have been foster parents back in the early 80s. Perhaps they can offer some some guidance on, you know, where to look. Um, Donna has just made a suggestion. And I think a lot of people are obviously thinking this. Her mom may have been a living domestic working in South Sound. So that's why they have Georgetown stroke South Sound. Um, so maybe the idea that she didn't leave that much information is legit. If you're telling me if that this is the two different places and I don't know, you know, yeah, I mean, South Sound is considered part of Georgetown. I've just never personally seen a birth certificate that listed both, but 
but Donna's suggesting an alternative here that maybe because your mom potentially worked in South Sound as a domestic helper that they put Georgetown comma South Sound. It's just unusual. Um, it's a place of birth, right? Like that's not, yeah, that, that's the, the no question. It's where you drop. That's where it's at. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. So the good thing is you've got a lot of online detectives here. Um, on your side. That's so awesome. I really, know. that's really cool. For yeah, a long time. Well, obviously that your mom was um, a domestic worker. Um, I think, I still think that there's some connection between your adopted mom and your biological mom. So she somehow mm -hmm. knew her. In my mind, that's the only explanation is she either knew the people that your mother worked for and her okay. adoption kind of thing. Cause there, there was no agency back then that was actively looking to put children out there to adopt because Cayman yeah. has never had, yeah, the, Cayman has never had that sort of arrangement and we don't have a lot of children. I might be one of the first, you're telling me? Sorry? No, what I'm saying I might saying be one of the first. There's not a widespread um, adoption agency here that would be looking to place children, especially just sending hmm. a child overseas. So your mom was more active and mm. I think then she perhaps let on, you know, so maybe she was, and maybe that's why I didn't see anything. Yeah. Cause I, I don't believe that. And again, anyone who is around, um, who's listening to this can certainly, you know, guide me in the right direction, but I have never gotten the sense even now in this day and age that, you know, adoptions are so prevalent here that we need to be mm. putting a bunch of children in foster care. The population isn't that big. I mean, you know, now mm. we're at about 60,000 and the vast majority of the population is actually expatriates, like 50%, basically. Wow. Wow. Um, yeah. And so for your mom as a Jamaican domestic helper to even be able to put you up for adoption in the Cayman Islands, that alone is very unusual <laughs> because for many, many years, how it worked is um, if you were domestic and you didn't meet a certain threshold in terms of your salary, you were able to have the baby, but then you had to send the baby back home. Wait, say happened. that again. Say that again. Say yeah, that. So that, this is what happens now, right? If you don't make a certain salary and you work here in the Cayman Islands and you have your child here, you're not able to put your child on your work permit. So you have to, you can have your child, but then you have to send your child back to wherever you're from. And this is kind of where I think was, this is what was going on is whatever connection your mom had, your bi biological mom, Lori, had with your actual mom, instead of sending you back to Jamaica, to her family there, mm -hmm. she was able to arrange for you to go live with Lori as an adult. Ah, like you think the expats were probably Minnesotans that had some ties. Yes, it has yeah. to be. They had to have some ties to the Cayman Islands. This is just not a random thing. Where your mom has never been here and she knew no. Oh no wow! She you really broke it down for me. Thank you. Yeah, she definitely has to have known someone here. So she either had family here or extremely close friends that could say to her, "This baby is available for adoption. Do you want to adopt this child?" Wow. Yeah. So I think that you know I don't know how you can find out more about the relationship because obviously your mom is deceased. And it's unfortunate she didn't tell you a little bit more, but there's definitely a bigger connection there. Dang, um, my grandma's gone too. That she probably would be the next one I'd go to. Yeah. Um, someone is asking, and this is a very interesting question, and this had crossed my mind, is is it possible that your father was actually Caymanian? Who knows? That's a blank slate now. They didn't even leave any nothing, not even an initial. They just left right. a blank. <laughs> Because again, the only reason I think, I think Janice is onto something. The only reason I think that that makes sense is because under what legal remit would you have been able to remain in the Cayman Islands, even for the adoption to take place? That's what happened so fast? Yeah. I mean, normally you have the baby and you, they might give you a month with the baby and then the baby's got to go. Because wow. you can't add the, the child onto your work permit. So the child okay. is here under like a visitor status um, until you can make arrangements to take the child back home. So that makes sense. They're able to keep you in the Cayman Islands long enough to even get you adopted. And out. the foster family. I was at the hospital for a month. They named me Sarah there. 
after a month, my mom did tell me that I went to the Frost family. So supposedly your mom just left you at the hospital for a month? Yeah. I mean, forever. She never came back. <laughs> but yeah, she so had- The narrative then is you were just abandoned by your mom at the hospital. Yes. That's been the narrative. And then I, mean, I was- that would, be, that would be such a big story here that I'm sure anyone who worked at the hospital in the 80s would have heard of this story. And I can't <laughs> even imagine people who lived here not hearing about a baby that was abandoned. Right, right. And that was my initial thought when I started going off on Facebook. I was like, somebody has to know about me. Come on, now I can finally reach out yeah. to them. Yeah, I mean, I think somebody, and I'm just trying to jog people's minds. 1983, you know, everybody knew everything. We're, we're called the Mall Road, but back then it was definitely the Mall Road. <laughs> you know, mm. everyone knew what was going on. So if anyone can kind of think back to the 1980s of hearing of a baby that was left at the hospital, um, you know, please reach out and provide some information. Um, Donna says also back in the 70s, Kimanian children were adopted by Canadians through agencies there and social wow. services here. And that's news to me. So that's very, very interesting. Great. Um, and then Lisa's asking, did birth mom have a work permit? Well, it sounds like she was here working. It says that she's working as a domestic. Um, that's a blister, yeah. Yeah, so Hortensia thinks that maybe social services might have something on file. The issue is, I don't know how well their archiving system is or how much, you know, they kept on file. I mean, that's obviously been a little while now. Um, yeah. But you could certainly ask them if they have records going back that far. Yeah, I mean, if if that bit of information could really get us somewhere, that's awesome. Cause I felt like I've always been told that there's just nothing you can even try. Okay. <laughs> just shut <it> down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no info. So. Yeah. Um, well, I don't, I don't believe that. I think the answers are definitely out there somewhere and someone knows something. Um, just a question for anyone who's listening. Do you guys know um, who might have been in charge of the hospital in 1983 that could potentially you know provide some information because that was a that was some another lead I think that we could certainly follow up on like who was the director or the head of the hospital back in the early 1980s. I have a question for you too because you said that there's like no agency because usually I mean there's a lot of a doctor yeah. over here so what how how does that happen like what well well like Donna said I think social services has always been the department oh, or the division that facilitates like adoptions and stuff like that. Yeah. And that's a, um, okay. Yeah. So that's like, you know, uh, that's a government agency basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So children and children's welfare issues, the registrar, that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. So, um, let me just see. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, so Lisa saying, which hospital? Well, back then we only had one hospital. Oh, that great. Was, that makes it easy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Georgetown Hospital. <laughs> so you would have definitely, and you know, the hospital here, Sarah is, um, you know, like when I go, what, how they identify you is by date of birth. They're like, For okay, real? your date of birth, because there, there would have been so few people like on my date of birth. I think there was only three other babies that were born at the Georgetown hospital in that particular What the day. heck? Are you kidding me? Yep. This is giving me so, so much help. You know, like, this is the kind of information that if you reached out to them and you said, hey, I was born on that particular day, they'll be able to say, okay, there was only you and another boy. Who do okay. I reach out to for that? Hold on. It would have been a maternity ward at the exact same time. So, yeah, there was only one hospital back then. Um, Can you text me that, that, that who I'm supposed to get in touch with? Yeah, we're going to find out. Um, Aldine says that... Um, Donna's correct. I had a family member who was adopted by a Canadian couple in the 1970s. In the 70s. Wow. Yeah. So that's an interesting connection. And then Trilby says someone at the hospital might know for sure. So I think following up with the hospital staff is definitely a good step to go in okay. that direction. Um, and then Tiana says that the hospital should have kept records of all births in the 1980s and maybe she can search for there for possible information names of mothers sex of the babies all of that should be recorded and i do agree with that i think that that information should be um probably relatively easy to obtain 
Yeah. So we can, I'll send you some information about how to contact hospital records. Okay. Um, and they can pull their archives and see what information they would have had for that day. At least, you know, you want to confirm what's on the documents that you have. So you yeah. want to confirm that that's actually your date of birth, for example, because, you know, oh, mistakes wow. happen here all the time. Like my initial birth certificate actually had the wrong date of birth. Wow. Well, and like you said, Jamaica was spelled wrong. So yeah, I mean, there's mistakes on there, right? And somebody else actually went and registered um, me for my mom, and that's where the mistake was made. They had the wrong. Just like me. (laughs) Yes. So they had me born on the 17th, and come to find out, I was actually born on the 18th of August. Dang. You know, there's mix-ups that can happen. So at least try to verify the information that you have and that you're working with to just confirm that it's it's accurate. Um, Kathy Gomez. So um, Shane says that Kathy Gomez should know more as she was at that hospital for many decades. Oh, wow. So that's a name that you can jot down. Um, she would be, I think, probably on Facebook. Okay. We could try to force her contact details for you. But, you know, a lot of these people are still around because the 80s weren't really that long ago. Luckily. <laughs> so, and I think it did it mention a midwife. And I wonder if anyone. Shirley um, Grandson. Yeah, I'm just going to have a look at this again, because I'm wondering if anyone might actually recognize um, who this midwife was. I, you know, don't know if this person is still around, but it does have the name registered um, as Miss, let me just grab it again, Shirley Grandson. So has anyone ever heard of Miss Shirley before? Grandson isn't a Caymanian name. So again, oh. she may have been here working from Jamaica or working somewhere else because that's not a typical Caymanian name, especially for back then. Um, so maybe she was, you know, here working at the hospital. But does anyone know um, a Shirley grandson from the 1980s that might have been a midwife at the hospital? Um, Lisa's asking if the doctor's information is actually on your birth certificate. I'm just going to have a look again. Can I ask you a question about the midwife? Because um, I was talking to my godmom about that, actually. And midwives aren't really listed on birth certificates here in America. Like, what does that mean, a midwife there? What is that? Well, mean? A mid- she's just the person who assisted with your delivery, basically. Okay, but she didn't do the entire thing. No. Um, I mean, some some people, and I know this. Somebody else was just asking this question about, you know, if the doctor was listed, it's entirely possible that you were delivered by midwife only. I mean, I okay. think that has happened here. Is that okay? Is that yeah. a common thing? So instead of the doctor's name being listed, um, it would just have the midwife's name instead, and that looks like that may have been, you know, what happened here. The other thing is is we don't know that you were necessarily born at the hospital. Sure. Like you could have been born at home. Yeah. And this is why I'm kind of wondering if that's why it says Georgetown and South Sound. You know, what is South Sound? Right. Maybe you were born at, I mean, this woman worked on Church Street, which is South Sound. So I'm kind of wondering if it's possible that you were actually maybe born at home, like this could have been a home birth. I mean, I don't so South know. Sound is a city. Yeah. South Sound is, is an area of Georgetown. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that's very possible that it could have been an at-home birth. Um, and these are just some things for you to think about that perhaps you had not thought about before. Definitely um, are. <laughs> comments that I think are interesting. So Ms. Aldine says that Captain Shelby Hyde's daughter was a midwife there from the 70s and may still be there. At least she was a few months ago. So um, I wonder if Aldine, do you know her name by any chance? I know you're saying that she's Captain Shelby Hyde's daughter, but do you have a name that would be, um, you know, someone that she could like say, okay, this is the name that I need to look for. So that's a midwife that has been there for quite some time. Here's another one that says that you can reach out to Kathy Gomez at the prison because she's now the prison chaplain. Okay. So her contact number there at work is 947-3000, um, area code 345. And then Cayman Bracker says that, yes, she was there until the 90s. She delivered my daughter. So let me just clarif- 
clarify this for Kim and Bracker. When you say she was there until the 90s, are you referring to um, Miss Shirley's grandson or are you referring to Captain Shelby's daughter? Because I'm a little confused about who you might have been referring to. Um, Lori Ann Harvey Foley says, I know Shirley. I knew Shirley, sorry. Jamaican midwife, and she left a while ago. So that's helpful. So I figured she probably was from Jamaica. So she was a Jamaican midwife. Um, so that's another lead that maybe we could try to see if she's still alive and track her down um, in Jamaica. Because the midwife, you know, listen, midwives, they're there during the, the delivery. They're there right after. You know, maybe she might remember your mom giving birth and might be able to tell you a little bit of like, did your mom mention she's from a certain part of Jamaica, who her family is? So another potential lead would be to track down um, to track down the midwife if she's still around. In Jamaica, yeah. Yeah. So, and that name doesn't sound like it's as, as common as green. <laughs> so Grandson, right. <laughs> yeah, it might be easier to find her. Um, so, Lorianne, thank you so much for that little tip. Uh, Paula says Miss Eloise Reed would be a good contact. Um, Paula, can you say in what capacity did Miss Eloise work at the hospital at the time? Did she work at social services? And then Aldine is trying to remember the daughter's name. Oh, right. So Paula says um, the daughter's name this is Captain Shelby, who was a mid. His daughter was a midwife. Her name is Shannon Hydes. So you'll want to take that name down as well because apparently yeah. she was a midwife going back quite some time at the hospital. So she okay. may not have been your specific midwife. But again, I can't imagine there were a whole lot of midwives there in 1983. So she might she might remember as well. And uh, so someone the, just is still there. I think I know she's the older lady, if I'm not mistaken. Miss Shannon is the one who's actually in charge of the midwife. She's in charge of the um, of the uh, maternity ward now. Like she's the nurse in charge of the nurses there. I believe that's who this Miss Shannon is. Okay there three years ago when I had my baby and she's still there. So um, again, you know, check out Shannon Hydes. She's at the hospital. Um, Yay, this is some leads. I love it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> at least there's something. Now yeah. I can harass these people. I'm and joking. Then, <laughs> and then she says Hazel Brown was also a nurse there. Um, Shane is really enjoying the program this morning, uh, this evening. He says, Cayman Mall Road is really doing a wonderful job with different types of issues. Job well done. I mean, yeah, we would love for you to find your mom and do like an update on this. And Yeah, I want to come there and visit y'all and, and make connections and absolutely yeah. touch motherland. <laughs> yeah. So someone else said, um, nurse for many years, retired chief nursing officer. So Paula was referring to um, I think a previous comment that she made. So we have a, um, a couple good leads, I think. Um, you know, someone has to know something more, I believe, about who you're related to, where your family is. So I really implore anyone who might remember anything from the 1980s, to please reach out. Um, we'll try to get some links on who would have been involved in the social services end. Okay. Maybe who was the director of social services, they might remember an adoption. Because like I said, I can't imagine that there were a whole lot of adoptions, even back then, that um, would have occurred in the- In, in general. It, yeah, I mean, if they had three or four, it probably would have been plenty back then. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And this one is international, so a little different. But they've been happening since the 70s there in Canada. Who knows? I don't know. Yeah. But stay stay committed. Yeah. Find <laughs> your mom. And that's going to open up, you know, a whole family of opportunities for you, I think. I'm sure she's got siblings. And you've got, you've got siblings. I do. There's yeah, two, there's at one. least. So, um... I don't know if when she had you, most likely if she was a domestic, those children would have been um, in Jamaica at the time. 
But okay. it's entirely possible people are very much back and forth. Jamaica is only a 45 minute flight from the okay. So it's okay. very, and there's a lot of Caymanian connections with Jamaican families and stuff. Okay. So your siblings could even be in the Cayman Islands right now. Like they could wow. have eventually migrated here as adults and are now working here and so on. So if anyone on island has the last name Green and you think that your mom may have had a child that was adopted, please reach out to Sarah because this could very well be a cousin, a sister, you know, your niece. That connection, I think, is very, very viable. Yeah, and I, I again, want to give you so many thanks just for um, publishing my story because, you know, uh, as Islanders, we we migrate everywhere. Like you can find somebody from the island everywhere. So it really takes like some some concerted effort to try to get the word out there. Yeah, for sure. And someone did mention like a um, ancestry or genetics kind of thing. I don't know how much help that would specifically offer because I mean you know that your mom is from Jamaica, so you know that is a country of three million people. <laughs> so right. It, Exactly. It be a big search. Um, but you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna put up your story. We've obviously got this video that people can watch. I'm gonna make sure that this is posted because sometimes we cross share on different platforms. Oh, I'm gonna I make see. sure that this video goes up on our YouTube channel. And then okay. I'm also going to put this in print. So I'll put it oh, up wow. on the site. Okay. And I'll share it with some of our media colleagues. So I'm gonna pass it on to the Gleaner and some of the other papers to see if they can publish it locally in Jamaica to trace somebody's memory. Thank you. Know? you. And anything yeah. you need from me, let me know. I'll, I'll give you whatever I have. Yeah. <laughs> Open book. I, <laughs> I am I'm faithful and committed to the fact that you will find your mom and you will find the rest of your family and, you know, just make that connection in terms of your identity and who, who you're connected to. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And like I said, even if it's a second cousin, a cousin removed, a friend of the family, you know, a neighbor, <laughs> that would make me feel a little yeah, better. Yeah, and Tina's feeling confident as well. He says um, she'll find out who, what she's looking for, and thanks to Kieran Morrow. Oh, thank you. Listen. That gives me so much hope. He is putting the positivity out there, girl. I received Rain. that. He said 48 <laughs> hours. And Shane, you know why Shane has the faith? Because we're known for finding and reuniting people with all sorts of things. Wow. So like lost wallets, handbags. You know, the local thief in the neighborhood. We okay. find it <laughs> in really short order. I but love Shane it. Is, um, Shane is putting it out in the universe that this is going to happen for you in less than 48 hours. Because <laughs> that's deep. I go. So that would be so hope, cool. I would be I there. I mean, as soon as I find out the information, I'm going to that. Me and my children. I've also written a book, actually. Uh, has yet to be published because it was kind of for therapy. But now that... I'm getting in the mix of this. Um, I'm going to publish it here in Minnesota. So that's called um, Orphan Rat Blues. So look up. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. We're going to keep an eye out. Well, thank yeah. you so much for joining us this evening. I really appreciate you sharing your story. Um, I do appreciate that these things are never easy. And I can't, I, I can imagine the longing to kind of know where you're from. You know, I wasn't really adopted as such, but I did leave and I lived with my aunt overseas. And there were times when I was kind of like wondering, like, what's everybody else doing? Like, what are the family yeah. doing? You know, like you do kind of miss that connection when you don't have it with your parents and you right. don't have them. Although I knew where they were and eventually I moved back here. It was still, you know, there is still a little sense of loss or sense of longing that I didn't grow up with them. So I do sympathize yeah. with your plight. And I also believe, and I'm going to put this out in the universe, that you're going to find her. You're going to find exactly hey, I see who she is. Like we say, who your mama is, who you for, <laughs> you know, you're going to definitely find her. And all okay. being sending some prayers out to you as well. Thank you. So, thank you, everyone. Yeah, Sarah, thank you so much for joining the program. I'm going to go ahead and um, just say a few closing words. And then okay. you and I will keep in touch. I'm going to send you some additional information. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay, again. great. All right, folks. So again, thank you so much for tuning in to another segment of The Cold Hard Truth. Um, if you know anything that can help Sarah, some of you had some wonderful suggestions about people that she can follow up with. And I will definitely send her um, some of those names and numbers and you know, put her in touch with social services. But if any of you 
have anything else that is triggered by this show, or you might have known her mom, but you didn't really want to come on this platform and say anything, you guys know how to reach me. 324-1612 is the WhatsApp number. You can message me on Facebook, of course. You can email tips at caymanmallroad.com. Let's help find, um, you know, Sarah's mom. Let's help find her family. So she was obviously very, very thankful to be adopted by um, this beautiful lady named Lori in Minnesota. And I can see, you guys can't see Sarah right now, but she's actually crying. Sarah, I see you crying and it really breaks my heart um, to see that that you're, you're in a place of, of longing and hurting and... <coughs> Oh my goodness. I see you, girl. I see you. I see you. It's going to be okay. You know what it is? It's that picture of the baby. Like, I long for her. You yeah. Know, just knowing how important it is to be held as a baby and those moments when you're separated from your mom. I'm a mom. I know how important I'm for that baby. Not for me anymore, but for that baby. You know, for her. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's okay. It's all right. It's okay. Yeah. I know it's very. And you're gonna find you're gonna find your mom, and um, I think anyone who is an adopted parent, the only advice I can give you is never keep information from your adopted children. It's not like they're gonna leave you. And I think maybe this is the great fear that they're gonna leave you, they're gonna abandon you, and you know people feel that. They've made this sacrifice. They've taken um, a child on. And whatever the situation was before that child was born or whatever situation they were born into, they have no control over that. So I would just say, you know, provide them with the information so that when you pass on or even when you're alive, if they want to reach out and make those connections and find out who they are for, give them the opportunity to um, to do so, because I think you end up leaving a void in their lives, potentially, that can never be filled. And some, some adopted children never want to know. They're perfectly happy with their adopted parents. They don't want to know their background. They don't want to know where they're from. But as Sarah said up front, there's some practical reasons a lot of times why you may wish to know your medical history or, you know, just your family. So um, again, if any of you have any information, I'm begging you please to reach out, provide the information. I do have some people um, who said that they know some Greens who were here in the 1980s. They're going to pass that information on. And so I have faith that, that we're putting this into the universe and our prayers will be answered and Sarah will definitely be reunited with her family. So folks, again, thank you so much for tuning into the program. And Thursday's segment, we're going to have um, an update. We might have a special treat for you guys. I can't say what it is yet because it's kind of very um, confidential at this point. But then, because we've got some people who are coming onto the program as special guests, and you definitely want to stay tuned and hear what they have to say. So, Sarah, thank you so much, my dear. I'm wishing you all the best and, and definitely stay in touch. All right, folks. You've been listening to The Cold Hard Truth. I'll see you guys on Thursday. Be safe until then. I know all